Welcome to Arts and Letters, a fun online series in which I get to talk with interesting creative people. I'm your host, Jenna Gordon. My husband David and I work with writers from all over the country, and we love finding new authors with stories to tell. Tonight's guest is no stranger to us. We've had the pleasure of working with Debbie Chin for more than 10 years, when we first met her as the executive director at the Carmel Bach Festival. We were indeed lucky when Debbie asked us to assist her in the preparation and publication of Dancing in Their Light, a daughter's unfinished memoir. The proud daughter of Chinese immigrants, Debbie Chin was born and raised on Long Island, New York. While other children took part in sleepovers, sports activities, and summer camps, Debbie's playground was the world of her family's highly successful restaurant and nightclub, the House of Mahjong, in Syosset, New York. There, from selling cigarettes at the age of three to performing as a Polynesian dancer throughout her teenage years, she forged a very unusual path towards an eventual career as a nonprofit arts CEO. Debbie traces her lineage back 13 generations, each carrying forth values of spiritual growth, eternal learning, the centrality of arts, humanities, and true compassion amidst war, poverty, separation, discrimination, and tragedies. Debbie's maternal great-grandmother, born around 1850, was a young child when discovered in a church lying next to her deceased mother. They were fleeing the Taiping Rebellion in Peking, China, making their way to Shanghai. The first of many twists of family fate arose when a missionary rescued, adopted, and named her Mary Hartwell. It is no wonder that Jebby Chin has forged a distinguished 30-year career as an arts activist and nonprofit consultant and CEO. Dancing in their light is the rest of her story. Welcome, Debbie, and it is so nice to have you with us on Arts and Letters. Hi, everybody. Good to see you. Good to see all the names. And uh, hi, Jenna, and hi, David, in the background. Hi, <laughs> great to have you here. I would like to start out this evening talking more about your the, the roots of your family and the missionary. Yeah, so uh, surprise, surprise, I have Southern Baptist roots. Uh, the man who started my family, his name was Jesse Boardman Hartwell Jr. He was a, a Southern Baptist missionary who was from South Carolina. So for those in this room who uh, are from South Carolina, you'll see the name Hartwell. And that's Jesse Hartwell on the left. Uh, he found a calling to be stationed in China to share the message of salvation among the Chinese. And he was the one that organized the first Protestant church in China, just north of Shanghai. And that was where uh, he found and discovered, as Jenna said, uh, my great-grandmother, who was lying next to her mother. And he raised her, he adopted her, and he named her Mary Hartwell. And Mary Hartwell in the picture is the second woman on the right holding a little baby. And she married a very big man, as you can see. His last name is Kuo, K-W-O-H. And that is my mother's uh, name, my mother's family name. Behind Kuo and Mary are three boys you'll see standing in the back. Uh, the one in the middle, that's my grandfather, Frank. And Frank uh, and the brothers all were, were raised by Mary Hartwell, so they were steeped in the Western tradition. Uh, they worked for Shell Oil, for the railroads, so they had Western connections, which played into uh, our life story in many ways. And uh, I didn't realize this, but uh, I, for some reason, I, I always buy gas at Shell, and that's where... Uh, what Frank worked, I <laughs> just put the two together. Uh, but anyway, but the uh, but this is the story of of, of, of what happens when uh, this family, when Frank and uh, he eventually uh, met a woman named Kate, and uh, and they had eight children. One died in childbirth, so there were seven remaining. And uh, grown up Frank is now seated on the right next to his wife, and my mother. My mother is the little, the tall girl standing on the left, just to the uh, to the right of Kate. And going around in this family picture is my mother on the left. Behind her is her sister Grace, her uh, the older sister Mamie, the older brother Teddy, the only boy, 
uh, uh, Bertha, and then my Aunt Daisy on the right-hand side, who plays a very prominent role in the building of my book, because uh, I got all my oral history through my Aunt Daisy. And the little girl in the middle is Edie, the youngest sister. But if you take a good look at this picture, this is one of the last pictures of this family intact. It wasn't soon after this picture was taken that the entire family began to uh, separate due to, due to war, due to the Japanese occupation and other circumstances. So this is a very rare, precious photo of a united family. Um, and one of the things that I talk about in, in Dancing With Their Light is they all managed to come to the United States except for Frank. He decided to stay in China because he had a concubine and his concubine was my mother's classmate in high school. So there's a whole bunch of <laughs> stories about that that, that, that uh, disrupted the family. But I think this is so precious because um, they were just very simple, innocent girls and families about ready to uh, experience the devastation of war, invasion, and poverty and starvation. Um, so that's that's the that's the the, the core of Jesse Hartwell. He uh, he was he married a woman named Eliza, and there are San Francisco roots. And I'm tracing back where Jesse Hartwell and Eliza lived in San Francisco. I'm, I'm I live in San Francisco. I work in San Francisco, and no doubt I have probably walked on the same streets mm -hmm. that Jesse Hartwell did. Uh, yeah. Decades ago. So let, before we go on, let's talk a little bit about the four women who are on the cover of your book, uh, basically the representatives of those folks in whose light you are dancing. Yes. So the two women on the left are my two great grandmothers. That's Mary Hartwell on the left. Uh, that is uh, the, the woman who um, gave birth to my grandfather, Frank. The woman next to her is my other great grandmother. Uh, she gave birth to my grandmother, Kate, who was to her left, the second woman on the, there. And the woman on the far right is my mother. So um, these, these were formidable women uh, back in the day uh, that really inspired me through their uh, sense of resilience, their, uh, their sense of self, their ability to survive and to um, unify, to keep unified uh, in, their, in their faith and their um and their, their their love of family so when it came time to come up with a title you know you'll see that i'm a dancer in in, in the story but i thought that it's their light that really guides me and i feel very much a uh, a kindred spirit to these these four women and i dedicate my book to my mother uh in particular yes so let's just talk a little bit about your mother and uh growing up getting close to the departure time. So the, for those who don't know that uh, the Japanese occupied China in 1937. Uh, this was a year that uh, uh, the, my family uh, still remember. It had a devastating impact. And I'll read you an excerpt from the book that uh, I call it the, um, the Annus, Annus Horribilis. Um, in December 13th, 1937, the Japanese invaded China in what was known as the Nanjing Massacre or the Rape of Nanjing. For those of you who have read Iris Chang's novel, she describes that in excruciating brutality. Uh, the invasion only lasted six weeks, but the emotional, psychological, and physical impact on Frank and Kate was felt during their entire lifetime, especially among their children. The Sino-Japanese War lasted from 1937 to 1945, and it was during those eight years that my mother Daisy and Edie, the three younger, younger girls, and their mother, Kate, subsisted on a diet of potatoes and cabbage, which was all they could afford, cooked in water. Now the sisters tried to grow vegetables, but the ground was so tough and yielded very little growth. But my dad, Daisy, recalls the sisters searching for seeds to plant, and, and after much coaxing of the soil, some turnips started to come to, into, into, into fruition. But it was common for people to steal from other people's gardens, and so the sisters gave up. Now, my mother and her sisters were well-educated, well so they were the lucky ones to have gotten jobs. And Mom and Edie worked in a bank, and my Aunt Daisy taught first grade reading and giving singing lessons in school. So music pay, plays a big part in our family at a very early age. But the money they earned was still not enough to buy food. The most they could afford was substandard rice or millet, deliberately mixed with sand. 
What do you say you know, about that? I, evil yeah. people, right? Evil people. Yeah. 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 And uh, and then along comes your dad. Along comes my dad. So let's just face it. My dad came here illegally uh, in 1930. There was the political instability of China uh, convinced Dad's mother to send him to the United States. For those who don't know, the Republic of China it started in 1911. Uh, so it's still a very new republic. Remarkably, before then, China was ruled by emperors, and the last emperor was six years old. And he abdicated, and that became the new start of a Republic of China uh, under Sun Yat-sen. So that, turb that turbulent time uh, caused dad's mother to just send him to the, to the United States, where his older brother, Eddie, had already settled in the Buffalo. And I talk about how difficult it was to come here. The only way to get here was by boat. There were no planes, really, in those days. And so um, on boat, he, my father got to Seattle and uh, with instructions to get to his brother in Eddie in Buffalo on the other side of the country. So my dad traveled on the Transcontinental Railroad from Seattle to the end of the line somewhere in the Midwest and he connected to New York Central to his final destination, Buffalo, uh, Central Terminal in upstate New York. Now during this time, Chicago businessman George Pullman had created the Pullman Porters these were former black slaves who left the South after the Civil War and during the Reconstruction era of 1865 to 1877. And George Pullman hired them to serve the white customers on luxury rail cars. And by the 19, uh, 1920s, the Pullman Company was the largest employer of black men in the United States. <laughs> and the rising anti-Chinese sentiment in the United States found a resonant chord with the Pullman Porters who understood the Chinese plight of racism and persecution. And taken under these porters' wings, my dad was kept hidden from sight on the train and allowed to ride the train across the country. But dad had a job. His job was sweeping up cigarette butts at the end of the night. And ever resourceful, dad realized there were still unused tobacco in those butts. So he unrolled the cigarette paper, took out the unused tobacco, put him in new paper, and then he and the porters used to smoke that before going to bed. And through the kindness of these porters who sheltered them and other Chinese boys, my dad was able to get from Seattle, Washington to Buffalo for free. So what do you suppose he ate along the way? I'm sure my dad was really resourceful. He probably picked up stuff. And my dad, would, so my dad was a chemist. I'll talk to you about that in a minute. But he, it, it, he was very much into uh, entrepreneurial. He was an inventor, basic heart. He was an inventor. But uh, I think the porters probably brought, brought him leftover foods that the white people didn't want to eat on the train. There were lots of leftovers. So I think dad ate pretty well. Dad said he didn't starve because the porters took good care of him. Mm -hmm. It's really remarkable the, the, the alignment of the, the African-American experience and the Chinese mm -hmm. experience during this time. Uh, there was, it was the huge wave of Chinese expulsion during, during this period. Mm -hmm. So that's a whole different story. But the, 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 the Blacks and the Chinese had at that time a very, very uh, supportive relationship because they had what it was like to be um, strong bonds. Yeah, yes. And so what happened when he arrived in New York? finally got to New York. He finally got to Buffalo. He attended uh, Buffalo High School and his interest in chemistry eventually got him elected president of the high school chemistry club. And uh, so, wait, so hold it right there. Uh, he spoke no English. No English. He and he a, was elected the president of the chemistry yeah. club. Yeah. It's amazing. He had a fifth grade education. He was a self-taught man. Mm -hmm. And this carries into uh, what he did to build our, 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 our business. But this goes back to, he was just built that way. Mm -hmm. He was, he was, he just was a survivor and he just figured stuff out. Um, but he loved to experiment with things. Uh, so he eventually, uh, saved up enough money. And then he attended New York university where he majored in accounting. He'd always wanted to go in business. And one of his professors of accounting was Robert McNamara. For those of you who don't know, Robert McNamara was uh, eventually the secretary of defense under uh, President Kennedy and President Johnson. But dad became a citizen of the United States and this allowed him to enlist in the military and he chose the US Marines. And he was eventually promoted to captain and he was assigned to World War II Intelligence Corps in the sixth division to probe the whereabouts of secret supplies of Japanese ammunition. This is after the Japanese invaded China. 
Now, after Japan's surrender to the Allies in 1945, which basically signaled the end of World War II, Dad's division had to go to Qingdao to oversee the surrender of the Japanese troops and to help stabilize Chiang Kai-shek's government. And by doing that, he went to Qingdao and that is how he met my mother. And these are pictures on the left of my, my young mother and father in courtship, their marriage. Um, and then the, on the last side, the, uh, the story about that is he was in the intelligence, so he knew that Mao Zedong was gonna seal the borders. The communists were now uh, in, involved with a civil war with the nationalists in, in China, and the communists were gaining strength and would eventually just seal the borders. And with dad's intelligence background, he knew that. So he got my mother, Kathy, on uh, China soil together. Yeah. But wow. they were, he was 34 years old, but very, very young. I mean, I, I'm now, uh, I, I'm not the age where they could be my kids, but, but uh, <laughs> they, they, came, they came with nothing. And they had to leave quickly because uh, they just had, they just couldn't, there was no time to pack. There was no time to do anything, but just get out before the border sealed. So they came with literally nothing. Came with really nothing except just their um, desire to make it big and to and to give something back to this country, which is a part of the ethos that I talk about in my book. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So they eventually settled on Long Island, New York. Um, there's a, in the book I talk about the the migration from. Uh, the West Coast to the East Coast, not without some tragedies. Um, uh, tuberculosis was the pandemic in the day. And uh, my mother and father had a, had a baby boy, my brother Lowell, who um, uh, inadvertently contracted tuberculosis along with my mother. And Lowell died at the age of 15 months. And my mother um, always tells the story about how she never, ever could bear the scent of carnations because that was served at Lowell's uh, service because it just uh, re just repelled her for the rest of it. They were the cheapest carnation. They couldn't they couldn't even afford a tombstone for Lowell. They couldn't afford anything. They just put a couple of toys in the in the in the casket. That's how poor they were. They came with nothing. And she was uh, in a recovery in a sanatorium. A sanatorium uh, for quite a while. The TB. The way they treated TB. Uh, it's hard to believe in, in these days. But they just took out her lung. They just took it out, uh, and that there was there was really very, no cure. It was such an early pandemic, and so my mother lived for all of her life as her young life uh, with one lung. But she was sent to recuperate in Redwood City, and in those days there were many sanatoriums for TB patients. There was not a vaccine yet in those days, and so there were um, there were numerous uh, uh, ep uh, episodes about how to uh, treat TB patients, and the only treat was rest. Um, that's what they just rest. My mother rest in the sanatorium. Rest and, and removal. And removal. And my mother had a huge scar in the back. She was very self-conscious about that. Her left side caved in and she, she could never sleep on the left hand side, on her left side. Yeah. She would say, you know, when, when I'm in a casket, I want to be on my left side. And I said, but you, You'll be you'll be facing anybody. She says, "I don't care." She says, she, she was never able, because that, that that she lay on her left side, the, there was nothing to support her. So she it compromised uh, the way she moved, the way she lay down, um, and it, it it compromised her health eventually. Obviously. And and meanwhile, your father is working and taking care of Kathy. He has to leave. He he now has to leave her behind in the sanatorium, and he goes to New York uh, where he eventually decides he wants to learn about how uh, Chinese cooks uh, operate. And there's a Chinatown in New York. And he just spent his time going up and down the streets of Chinatown, talking to the chefs, just looking to see what they brought from their from their home country. And uh, and he took my sister with him. So our parents, uh, my parents separated for a while. Then when my mother was better, then she was able to reunite with my father and my sister in, in New York. And tell us what led up to those months or years that led up to the beginning of the first restaurant. Well, uh, so on Long Island, uh, for those who don't know, Long Island was very homogenized then. And, and uh, there's the first suburb of the United States was called Levittown, created by a man named Bill Levitt, William Levitt. That was about eight miles from where we eventually settled in Syosset. And there was a covenant that William Levitt established 
for Levittown, which basically said he will not send sell any of the homes to a Negro. He did not want black people living in Levittown. So, so this was very big in, in Long Island. It was also Robert Moses who built all the parkways, but he also, Robert Moses also designed bridges that were low, too low that, that buses from New York City couldn't get through with Puerto Ricans and people of color. It's a fascinating history about Long Island in those days. But juxtaposed against that, we were uh, a rare family of color coming into a very homogenized uh, part of the country. However, uh, my father uh, loved people. And so he was told if you wanna make any business connections, join the Kiwanis Club. And he did. And one of the people in the Kiwanis Club was the banker of Long Island National Bank who took a liking to my dad and uh, gave him the funds to, um, to buy an old potato barn. Uh, Long Island was potato fields long before it came to de developed. And uh, Long Island potatoes were a very big a delicacy and a commodity way back in the day. Uh, and so um, dad began to network with the Kiwanis Club and, and other businesses and he just pounded the pavement to try to find a way. He started a, 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 a first uh, restaurant that was called King Wa. It was on a, a corner lot and he loved the corner lot. He was into identifying prime locations. A corner lot is a prime location. And he learned you know, how to work in a kitchen. He learned to experiment. He learned, uh, he learned to use his chemistry skills to create different dishes. He never wrote down a recipe. He uh -huh. just started all over again. And that's how they came up with house specials. They tried it on a customer. And if a customer liked it, they got put on the menu. So based on, on that, he finally just, he finally was able to leave that and then uh, eventually start the Mahjong restaurant with the, uh, with the, with the capital uh, investment that the banker get, gave him to buy a barn for $60,000. Uh, and in those days, there was no paperwork. He just shook the hand of the banker and the banker gave him the money. Uh, <laughs> everybody loved my dad, right? So, uh, so obviously we all joined in the family restaurant, the family business, that's what we did. You know, we just, it was, it was we just had to work there. And, um, and my first job was working at Mahjong restaurant and I joined the workforce when I was three years old. And uh, my first job was selling cigarettes. There were no vending <laughs> machines in those days, but mom ordered cartons of uh, cigarettes and each week my job was to take out the, the cigarettes from the, the cartons and display the cigarettes in a glass case. The case was roughly four feet tall and three feet wide, and it had a glass on the top and the front so the customers could see the cigarettes and cigars for sale. And a sliding glass door at the back allowed me to reach in and grab a pack and go on tiptoe and hand it to the customer on the other side. I arranged the cigarette packs by color. At a very early age, I loved to organize. To the left, the white packs, which were Lucky Strikes and Camel, <laughs> L&M, Kent, Viceroy and Territon, then I lined up the red packs, Paul Mall, Winston, <laughs> Marlboro, then the blues and the greens, Salem and Newports. And also inside the case was a small dish with a wet sponge, which was a little humidity to keep the cigarettes and cigars moist in that, in that case. And there was a small little change box with a coin slot on top. And uh, eventually I learned uh, how to give out change from that coin box. It, cigarettes were 45 cents a pack in those days. So I would be given a dollar and I used to hand out, forgot to hand out change. There were no adding machine tapes. We just mentally calculated. Um, and I love the, 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 the my, my memory of this in, in the book is the, the way that your mother taught you how to make change. Yes. And that you would stack all the little coins up and, and at three, between three and six years old, you were already doing that. I was also I was also sort of an accountant. <laughs> you know, I had to reconcile my cigarette sales because my mother would make sure that everything that that, that that she would count that we'd count the leftover inventory, and what was in the change box was what we took, and I had to write down how much we sold. So I didn't realize it, but I was a baby accountant in those days. <laughs> So uh, pushing but, cigarettes. Push, oh, oh well, oh, it gets better. <laughs> so then my mother. So I love to go. I love to go inside the case and smell it because I love the smell of tobacco, <laughs> and it was very exotic smelling. And the cigars, they were beautiful in there. The cigars had ribbons, and they were just colorful. You know, cigars were colorful in, in those days. And I looked at my little canvas there, and I was so proud of it. And I just loved to inhale and sell. Um, <laughs> 
mother got a little worried about that. So when I was six years old, uh, I graduated <laughs> helping Kenny, the bartender, make the garnishes for drinks at the bar. So I impaled toothpicks in olives and onions for the Manhattans. And I used special toothpicks with colorful flags uh, to spear the maraschino cherries and the Manhattans and for the more exotic drinks like the Singapore slings. And then there were cartons of fresh lemons. Everything was fresh at Mahjong. Uh, no canned or concentrated juices. Uh, so fresh lemons were brought up from the kitchen to the bar and each lemon half was freshly squeezed on a manual juice press with a heavy rotating handle. And sometimes Kenny would put a half lemon onto the round plate and let me pull on the handle. And he said, it was good. It's good for your muscles. Um, now we also squeezed oranges, which was a challenge, but grapefruits, forget about it. Uh, but it was, Mahjong was in a prime location across from Syosset Hospital, uh, in a electro, big electronics store and a, bio, a mile from Grumman Corporation on Jericho Turnpike. And nearby office workers came in and would sit and chat with me. And as a six-year-old girl on a bar stool putting toothpicks and cherries, I was a bit of a novelty. <laughs> My mother said, you're good for business, just stay there. <laughs> Customers ordered more drinks. And, 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 and my father just loved it because the bar got busy because people just surrounded me and was talking to me. And I had no intention of being a bar fly before I was old enough to drink. <laughs> yeah. But this all had educational value because it taught me how to engage in small talk and to put people at ease, which is what I have always done in my, in my career as, uh, as uh, working in development and fundraising and now as a CEO. Um, and those were the, the, the foundations of my career, uh, not selling cigarettes, but learning how to sell, <laughs> learning how to upsell. I, I tried to add a cigar to a cigarette pack for like 50 cents and had some more cigarettes. So I learned, I learned how to hawk it, basically. <laughs> did, was it fun? Did you have fun doing this or did I you? Last. I, have, I thought everybody had a restaurant. I, I you know, I, at, we we didn't go home. We just stayed. That was we woke up. We drove. Mom drove us yeah. to the restaurant. We worked, and then we came. We did, I did my homework at the restaurant, and I would come. We eat there, and I thought everybody had this kind of a set. I had no idea uh, until one uh, classmate said, "Oh, we're having dinner at our house." I thought, "Oh, you dinner at the house? Interesting." <laughs> the house it was so far. All I knew was restaurants at a very early age, and I thought, and I thought everybody had uh, their teachers. So our teachers used to come into the bar. This was very interesting. They had different personalities at the bar. <laughs> so uh -huh. I also saw them in school the next day. Um, and I knew which teachers got um, a little lubed up. <laughs> so, so I had a very interesting relationship with my teachers as a young girl. I was a quiet student, but I was actually like a, I was a, a chatterbox at the bar. I felt very comfortable there. Still do. And, and you've been chatting ever since. <laughs> chatting ever since. <laughs> So do you remember like the conversations that people would have with you? I do. They'd ask me about school and I didn't know what to, I said, but school is fine. Um, they'd ask me just certain things like, what do you, what's, what's your favorite food? Or when I wasn't working at the bar, I would also uh, make wontons. We made fresh wontons, uh, peel the snow peas. So we did a lot of uh, kitchen prep too. And so the, uh, the customers would just ask general things, you know, uh, what do you like to eat? And you know, what are you learning at school? What's your, but I had, I didn't learn to read. I wasn't reading at the age of six yet, so I didn't know what to say. But I just, just chatted about, they love to talk about sports. And, um, and you know, what I've learned is that even though I don't know what people are talking about, I just sort of smile and I, and I just sort of kept, kept listening. I kept listening to people and I learned the art of listening as well. Um, and they were just, uh, it was just a very interesting environment to grow up in. It was loud. The, the cocktail mm -hmm. shakers, the cacophony, the cash register going off. I remember growing up in that noise, um, which uh, which is, is a comfort to me. I'm, I'm very, yeah, I hate to say it, but I'm very comfortable in a bar. <laughs> so, Why not? Tell well, give give us a little visual of you making pot stickers. Well, so the uh, so the waiters would they take mount they made the meat fresh at Mahjong. Everything was fresh. So to make the one ton stickers. Uh, they they would get fresh noodles from Chinatown and, and noodle wrappers, all fresh. And Dad would go into Chinatown, which is about an hour each way, to pick up fresh noodles every morning and bring them back. 
and though the noodles and the and the chefs would uh, cut them into uh, the sizes of, of, of one ton square square sizes and then they would make the meat filling and they would take this big waiter's tray and plop like a three foot mound of meat on there and my my brother and i and the waiters would sit around with our one ton fresh one ton wrappers uh an egg wash and a knife and we would just take scoops and we would twist and roll, twist and roll. And those were for the one ton soup or fried one tons. And then my brother and I had a race to see who could make the most one tons uh, in like an hour. And I, uh, and I figured out the way to win. Don't put any meat in it. <laughs> my mother busted me. Customers complained there's no meat in some of the one tons. Uh, so I got fired from that job as well. Uh, but it was just really great to, uh, they don't do that anymore. In restaurants, it's, it's too labor intensive to make fresh wonton. It took hours to put those together and you never froze the wontons. You just make, you try to make enough for uh, what you, th who you thought would be coming in for dinner that night. So you just guessed at it. Um, and then you sh whatever leftover wrapper uh, uh, was, uh, was um, left behind, they got fried and they got made into fried noodles that were used for, uh, with duck sauce to put on the table as guests walked in. So we didn't waste anything there. And remind me uh, and tell our guests about the concoction that you made when you were uh, oh. supposedly refilling the soy sauce. I know. I get, I, I, my mother went prematurely gray because I'm, I'm <laughs> sure of it. But uh, I think I sort of inherited my dad's love of chemistry or experimenting. But, you know, you have to do sides, right? So uh, about three o'clock when the lunch crowd is out, before the dinner crowd comes in, I had to go and restack the sugar packet. Sugars were in packets in those days. Um, soy sauce was in bottles. They, they weren't in little packets. They were in actual bottles, little, little cruets. And there was a salt and pepper shakers on the table. Those were on every table, a set on tablecloths. Uh, Mahjong was a very um, a formal place, but it was not an expensive place. So in going through and trying to fill the soy sauce bottles, or I would take my Coke and I go around the tables and I think, Hey, I'll put a little Coke in the soy sauce bottle, a little pepper, and I shake <laughs> it up, and I go to the next table and make another elixir of some kind, and <laughs> and uh, and then customers finally complained that the soy sauce was rancid and it tasted like you know carbonated soda, and my mother finally figured out that I. I've been there. So yeah, I, little did they know that that charming little girl at the bar was poisoning them at the table. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> Um, before we move on, let's uh, just for a moment see that lovely picture of the your family and the uh, sort of at the beginning of Mahjong. I actually think it is the first anniversary. Uh, anniversary. Is that the first anniversary yeah, picture? That's first yeah. anniversary. That's my sister, my grown up, my uh, sister on the left, my brother and me. I'm uh, three years old in that picture. Um, roughly two or three. And my mom and dad. And on the left is a picture of my mo mother and father. Uh, during Chinese New Year, which was a very big celebration at Mahjong. Uh, it, it, Mahjong was open every day of the year, every single day except one, uh, two, Chinese New Year. We closed the restaurant for a big banquet and we donated all the proceeds to the Chinese Cultural Center of Long Island. Because mom and dad realized that when the communists took over China, they just destroyed all the cultural artifacts and history. And it was very important to them to work with an organization like the Cultural Center to preserve uh, cultural heritage. And so they uh, they just gave all the money back uh, to uh, the Chinese Cultural Center. And uh, this was a huge two day celebration with a, with a lion dance and gongs and firecrackers and dancing. And, and I talk a lot in the book about um, after all of the public were, uh, were finished with the banquet, uh, my father turned the Mahjong dining room into a gambling den and all the chefs came out and waiters came out. And I talk in the book about how I, uh, how I grew up around gambling. And I, uh, I stood by waiters as they were playing poker or dominoes. And if they, if I stood by a waiter and they had a winning hand, they'd give me a couple of dollars. And so I learned to look for the waiter that had the body language that looked like he was winning. <laughs> so, and, and I made a lot of money. I made four hundred dollars one year, which was I was like ten years old, and I and I thought this is really easy. It's a lot of it's pretty good money for looking cute. And then I so I so I loved. I grew up learning to love to gamble, 
Uh, and uh, my, my father uh, is, is a, was a big gambler, got us in trouble many times. Uh, but that was the, kind of the, the characteristic of this restaurant. It was everybody began to come to it because it was so good. The food was exquisite. It was uh, what I call radical hospitality, fanatical hospitality that I have embedded in every single organization that I've run. I want every business that I run to feel very much like you're coming to a home. You're coming mm -hmm. back, you're coming in the community. Um, and I feel that that's, that's, that's a missing um, ethos. So mm -hmm. um, in every uh, place I go, I want people to feel like they're coming into their home. And then in 1959, you had a little trip to Hawaii and that changed everything. Absolutely. So uh, Hawaii became a state in 1959, for those who don't know. Uh, and it, in those days in New York, in Manhattan, uh, there was a Polynesian uh, nightclub circuit in Manhattan. And I talk about uh, Hawaii Kai and Trader Vic's and the Lexington Hotel. Uh, they were designed by, uh, by stage directors uh, who uh, also designed for the Met and for TV shows. And this was a big ex extravaganza, but there was a fascination with Hawaii. Um, and so we went to Hawaii in 1966. And that was the aha moment for dad because it fostered in all of us a, a love, an unshakable love for the Polynesian and Hawaiian culture. And it was the catalyst for Mahjong 2.0 because the restaurant was so packed all the time that the small dining room, that's the old potato barn dining room was always packed. And so expansion was necessary. And so dad conceptualized a new dining room at Mahjong featuring a Polynesian nightclub uh, inspired by our experiences in, in Hawaii. And so dad and an architect uh, named Michael Spector, a very famous architect in, on Long Island, who was known for changing the face of Long Island, uh, they created the still recognizable stone facade facing the, the main highway with stunning floor to ceiling windows and framed by wooden beams bending into a hint of a pagoda. But here's the thing, transforming the building from a barn to a restaurant and a nightclub was a remarkable feat because the facade was all stone and rock. And each stone and rock was inlaid piece by piece by a stone and marble company called Antelope. And when we show pictures of construction uh, of, of the renovation, there are piles of rocks everywhere waiting for sorting, measuring, and cutting and installation. Uh, so Mahjong's new dining room was named the Aloha Room as an homage to the Hawaiian spirit and it allowed us to seat another 150 guests. I might also point out that the building that you saw earlier, uh, there was no other building like it in the world. It was custom designed for Vedette Specs. Mm -hmm. And one of my, uh, my next goals is to try to preserve it from being demolished because it is now chopped up and it's, it's now um, commercialized, but I don't think people realize that that building was put together by hand. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There were no cranes, there were no machines. And so let's discuss the floor show and, well, look, just first we'll look at this. So These are the that stones stone, that he's talking about. All that stone, each of the, every one of those little stones and rocks had to be just measured to uh, also give us sense yeah. of this diversity and the different shades of the stones. There was great care. And that's why um, this is a remarkable, uh, unique building uh, truly i think i think it's it's historic and this room with the curtains is that the main dining room that's the aloha room that's the extent that's the aloha that's yeah. the new part that's the new part mm -hmm. goodness yeah and when did the arch that you are sitting in front of right now when did the arch go in that went in a little bit so, later i believe for those who don't know this is this is a i'm not really sitting in front this is the mahjong uh dining room at, after my dad did another renovation. This is in the 19, uh, late 1970s, but he created this big arch to, for dramatic flair to uh, move into the original dining room. Yeah, I love that picture so much. <laughs> um, but the Polynesian entertainment, uh, so that was the Aloha room, and uh, but you have to find entertainment, right? So uh, dad was referred to a woman named Leah Kirk, who was a, a steel guitarist and whose recording troupe Leah Kirk and the Hawaiians had been prominently mentioned in Hawaii society columns. 
1950, the Honolulu Star Bulletin's reporting from New York column by Ann Koga uh, offered an off the beaten track nightclub near Lexington Hotel in New York, uh, featured Leah and her husband, Bill. Uh, there was a place called the Ringside Cafe at 8th Avenue and 49th in Manhattan. And it was within the thriving Polynesian nightclub circuit in Manhattan. But the writer also says that Leah was born near Hilo on the Big Island. And she's a, she's a member of the Hokia family there on her mother's side. She left the islands when she was a youngster and she played all over the mainland. And last summer, Leah and Bill made an album of Hawaiian songs on signature records. Leah is one of the first women guitar players to become a recording star. And that's what she looked like. And I describe in my book that to me, she was my Hawaiian Ethel Merman. She had a booming voice. She smoked constantly and she would always have a, a cigarette on her hand. She never really flicked the ashes. She just let the cigarette get to be, uh, the ashes get to be glowing at the end. And I always thought she held a glowing worm. And then when it came time to, for the, for, the, for the ashes to tip over, she just cupped her hand and just flipped the ashes in her hand. I thought it was magical. But she was a, she was a large than life woman. Uh, and she would, uh, she played a mean steel guitar. She was, uh, she was a, an accomplished uh, musician. Very rare for women headliners to do that in those days. And so a Polynesian show is incomplete without a sword and fire dancer. Um, and so we yes. a true Samoan chief, his name was Chief Taofi, and he thrilled and terrified the audiences with his knife throwing and his flame throwing. And mm. so um, uh, Here there's you. Chief Taofi. So you see the knife there, look at those hooks at the end. He, uh, and that is Taofi, doing the fire dance you can see he's got the those that's real fire real and that's fire. burning on the ends of of the, the um, soles of his feet mm -hmm. uh, but it's also he's holding a, a a knife or what's what is burning actually there so he, he's got the knife and around the knife is benzene soaked rags yeah, right right uh on, bo on both sides sides of the knife but that is uh, that is what a Samoan chief looks like, by the way. <laughs> he, he truly is a he was royalty, and those knives were quite heavy. Um, and so, you know, it's a novelty. I guess Mom was tired of me selling cigarettes, tired of me uh, putting toothpicks in bars, and tired of me making one tons with no meat. Uh, so, as a novelty, I was added to the Polynesian floor show when I was eleven years old. And eventually I was trained by Chief Taofi to do a knife dance. And one of Chief Taofi's routines included that Samoan twirling knife that uh, had that very sharp hook at the end. And he would make his entrance by racing on stage with a blood curdling Samoan warrior cry, the knife held in one hand and a pineapple in the other. And he would strut around the stage bantering with the audience. And then suddenly he'd lop off the top of the pineapple with the knife to show how sharp the knife was. And then he offered the open pineapple to the guest in the front row, and then he proceeded to do his knife dance. He twirled the blade close to his body as he flipped it in the air, catching it behind his back, avoiding the blade, twirled the knife between his legs, tossing them in the air. Then he hooked the knives together and he swirled them around, creating a frightening scene because the stage was so small. And the knives came very close to the, the singer's microphones. This and the fire dance were the only two numbers of the show where photography was not allowed. Because in those days we had uh, flash cameras and mm -hmm. the flash cameras would have been uh, distracting and dangerous uh, for Tofi. So considering this peril, <laughs> I was stunned when Leah and Tofi asked me to learn this number. So Tofi provided a smaller knife. It was about three feet in total length with a polished wooden handle and a dull blade, but a very sharp hook at the end. And it weighed over five pounds. So I learned this routine during the summer. So Taofi drove from Queens, which is near Manhattan, to our home, Syosset on Long Island, on the weekdays to teach me uh, how to dance. And since Mahjong was always busy, we rehearsed at the on the redwood deck of our home. So he taught me special routine, using only one knife, thank goodness. And I learned how to 
Yes, balance the knife to build up maximum speed and my routine with figure eight movements, spinning the knife in one hand and then behind my back and then switching to my other hand, twirling the knife to my calves a couple of times. Then I would carefully toss the knife between my leg, catching it with one hand, doing a backflip and then tossing it in the air, catch it on my back. So we rehearsed this until my arm muscles were well past sore and I was strong enough to do the number. By the time Tofi thought I was ready, our redwood deck was nicked and dented from all the times I dropped the knife. And how about you? Did you ever hurt yourself? Absolutely. I was all black and blue and I hurt <laughs> myself and I was just a wreck. But performing the sword dance was a different story because I wore glasses during rehearsal so I could see the knife. But we never wore glasses during a performance and I didn't have contact lenses. So I did this routine with my 2200 eyesight. So sometimes the hook caught my thigh, oh. I dropped the knife while trying to catch it. But Tofi taught me just keep going and have fun, right? The show must go on, keep going and have fun. And I learned that even though I was totally humiliated every time I made a mistake, I just had, I learned how to just work through it, which is kind of what I do as a CEO. Uh, <laughs> but Leah liked to mix it up. So one day she said, hey, you should learn a fire dance. So there was no way I could learn a fire dance like to, oh, you saw what he did with his feet. Uh, not with my eyesight. And hadn't I been enough with the knife dance? But Taofi envisioned a fire pit. It was a prelude to his sword number. And this involved me stepping onto the stage, strutting around stage to the sound of the drums before, before slow, slowly stepping onto a pit of fire. Yes, pit of fire. <laughs> So to prepare, I had to build calluses on my feet by walking barefoot outside as much as possible, especially on pebbles or any hard uneven surface. And I practiced on the hot asphalt of our driveway. And after a while, Toopi said, I was ready. So back to the redwood deck we went. So he placed this large industrial walk with a two foot metal stand on, on the redwood deck. And I practiced by stepping up onto the walk, getting my balance, doing some hand motions and then slowly stepping down one foot at a time. So wait, you, both feet were in the walk at one time? Eventually I had to get one okay. foot up, balance, right. get the other foot up, because this is the walk is curved. Got it. And so I had like balance and then one foot down, the other foot down. And meanwhile, you did all these hand motions. Uh, so, so after I got used to that, it was time for the fire. So he soaked rags in benzene and put them in the wok and he lit them. And the fire wasn't that high. It was just up to my calves. <laughs> Same calves I got. Excuse me, my favorite line okay. of the book. It is true. Say that one more time. The, the fire was not that high, just up to my calves. <laughs> Uh, I could have I could have done Joan of Arc. When you think about it. Uh, the same calves I got hooked got caught in the hook of, of, of my knife, which they did a lot. But Toopi said to step on the fire one foot at a time, then the other, stay two seconds. <laughs> step off with one foot, <laughs> then the other. Now he demonstrated by years with feet thickened by years of, of, of fire dancing. But do you know how hot fire is on the soles of your feet? It's very no, hot. It's no, I very don't. Hot. It's very hot. <laughs> and I managed to step up, but I left off before the other, I could get the other foot on there. It was just painfully hot. So Toofy used the garden hose to spray on my feet. And th there was sizzling sounds as he called me. Called me. Oh. <laughs> then we try again. And I got a little better at it. I was determined to do it. I got a little better at it. And I could stand in the fire for two seconds, then three seconds without yelling in pain. And after much rehearsal and now a nicked, dented, and charred redwood deck, I just told Toofi I couldn't learn this number. I didn't want deformed feet. <laughs> I had enough problems finding a date for the prom. So I told Toofi that no one would take me to the prom if I looked disfigured. So my dramatic pleading, all those early years of selling cigarettes and upselling and cavorting at the bar, that convinced Toofi and Leah uh, that I shouldn't do it. And I never performed that number at Bajan. And I have beautiful feet now, I must say. <laughs> yes, great. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's that, the, the most interesting, I mean, I love your whole story. And of course, I know it really well by now because we've been working together for a year and a half on developing this beautiful thing. Uh, 
and it, and all of that life that time in the restaurant business learning to perform being in front of an audience gathering people together here is the whole ensemble with with Debbie and her little brother down there in the middle and these were your people my people yep we had a rotating band and I uh I just was surrounded by these wonderful da exotic dancers. They were just exotic people and very talented, surrounded by music all through my life, music and dancing mm -hmm. and singing all through my life, very early, very early age. Well, I know that I could listen to you and talk to you all night. We only have a few minutes left and I want to spend a little bit of time on what you did when you grew up and left that performing arts world for another well you know, i'm an accidental uh ceo i i i was going to major i want to major in, in, in i want to be a classical pianist because i played music as a young girl I played guitar and piano and i'm also quite klutzy so when it came time for my piano audition i was uh, was just playing field hockey and i jammed my finger playing hockey and i couldn't do my audition so i had to pick another major to go to college and i picked theater and so I just teeter tottered into it, and I and I had no training. I just learned as I went. I never went to grad school. I uh, I don't have an MFA, uh, but I've learned through hard knocks. I've learned by by just doing, like my father. I've learned by by trial and error, and uh, and in many ways that I think has been a great lesson because businesses are not so rigid nowadays after the pandemic. We've got to be so um, malleable and experimental and uh, forward thinking about how we keep our businesses relevant. Mahjong lasted decades because of that philosophy. Mm -hmm. But the, um, the other piece that was so, uh, that's been ingrained in me is my mother and father were very empathetic, giving, generous people. Uh, I talked about that the restaurant was across the street from Sasa Hospital. Now they would never tell anybody this, but uh, they, mom and dad would bring food there to the uh, the nurse staff and the interns who worked the graveyard shift. Uh, they just bring food to just feed them something. And whenever there was a customer who had a child going through a surgery, mom would bring a toy from her gift shop and bring them over to the nurse's waiting station to deliver to the child in the room uh, when he or she recovered from surgery. But that's just kind of what they did. Uh, they gave to the little league, they gave, they donated everywhere. So my sister and my brother and I grew up in this culture of supporting, giving back and being selfless. And uh, I didn't know it then, but I, I, was, in, I was in the world of philanthropy mm -hmm. growing up. They donated food to everybody. Um, they never said no. They couldn't give money, but they gave, uh, they gave themselves and they gave food. So, you know, that is love, right? That's, that's true, true love. And it, they became so successful that um, they were asked so many times to, to, to give donations. And they, they always gave, even in their retirement years. Little Sisters of the Poor, Easter Seal, um, every, their, their giving was vast. And so for me, growing up in the environment, I realized that this fanatical hospitality, this ethos of caring is something that I've really centered in every, every job I've had and every relationship that I had. Um, coming out of the pandemic, I think it's more, more essential than ever to care and to, to take care of each other. Mm -hmm against the hostility of, of what we're seeing in the world. But, um, but this is the, uh, this truly is the, uh, the, the, the aha moment for me of my ancestors who have gone through so much uh, persecution and so much adversity to just keep making it and giving back, serving uh, their community. And we do serve the community, we serve people, we serve the community. And uh, this has been uh, my North Star Mm -hmm. uh, it took this, it didn't take this long to realize, it took this long to write about it. About the <laughs> and and I, I, I really would love to see that picture of uh, Debbie and David at the Carmel Bach Festival before we move on to, yeah. Yes. yeah. That picture to me yeah. exemplifies your enthusiasm, not to mention his enthusiasm for the performing arts world and the, the joy that you have in your work. Well, I think one of the things that I realized about me being a, a, a executive director or a CEO is I come from the, as, a, as an artist, right? So I grew up 
dancing and singing, performing. And I happen to be an executive director that handles the business side. But I'm one of the rare ones, I think, that actually is artistically centered. And mm -hmm. it actually makes me um, really want to take good care of the, the, of the artist who, uh, who do so much to uh, make our society really wonderful and whole. And that's how I've approached my, my, my jobs and, and uh, what I look for in, in an organization I join. I want that, that, that spirit of respect for the artists and the artisans who are, who are the, of the noblest professions that I can imagine. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, we have come to the close of this beautiful thing. I, I appreciate you so much. I could talk for, with you for two hours. We did that during the whole the time we were developing the book. We talked every two weeks and we planned an hour and it was generally two hours because well, I, there was so much to say. And, and you know, a lot of this is, I talk about, and to be clear to everybody in, in the room today, this was not all joy and happy and easy times for the family. Mahjong caused a lot of financial pressures in our family. It caused a lot of fights in our family. My mother and father fought constantly. Uh, my father loved to gamble. He didn't communicate with my mother. And I and there is, I'll tell a funny story, that dad loved to gamble. He loved to hang back at the restaurant. He never told mom he was never coming home that night. And she got really mad. So she wrote with big magic marker on the kitchen window, the kitchen wall, did not come home that night. And my father came home in the morning. He looked at it. He went to bed, which got my mother even more pissed off. But... <laughs> He did it again. He, so I was I was getting ready to go to school and I walked out and I saw by the curb what looked like my father's pants. And I looked at it closer and I realized that the crotches had been cut out. My mother cut out the crotches of my father. He never did it again. Never did. <laughs> but, uh, but that's the spirit of my mother. She was just a force of nature. That's a perfect way to end this conversation, Debbie. Yeah. Thank you. Dancing in Their Light, A Daughter's Unfinished Memoir by Debbie Chin. It is available wherever books are sold. Please patronize your local bookstore if you are lucky enough to have one. For more information about Debbie Chin, visit her website, debbiechin.com. And I am Jenna B.B. Gordon, host of Arts and Letters, and I thank you for joining us for this episode. Please subscribe to our mailing list for news about upcoming arts and letters online events. We thank you for coming. Thank, thank you, everybody. Debbie. Thank you. Thank you. See you next time. All right. See you next time. Thanks, everybody.